wanted to use really sure. Sure. Well, good morning. I know you're already shocked because you didn't know Robertson could look this good. <laughs> they keep me uh, hidden in the back, see, so nobody can see you know, what they look like underneath the beers, uh, and yet uh, that's me. I want to start today by just thanking all of you for what you do. Uh, I was a pastor for 22 years before I went back to the family business. Uh, building duck calls, although we don't build a lot of duck calls, at least the family doesn't anymore because we're all over the country spreading the good news of Jesus. So I think God had a plan for the Robertson family. Thank you, Ian. Um, I really thank you guys for what you do. The, that Holy Spirit journey that you take every week, uh, that Wednesday and that Sunday, uh, that realize and sit down with those folks, that means more than anything. And so thank you for, the, uh, for what you do, putting it on the line. Week in and week out. Also, I'm very grateful uh, to Watchman on the Wall for Tony Perkins, a good friend of ours, a fellow Louisiana, uh, who's here in Washington uh, for us. And so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity. Now, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about uh, our family and sort of how I fit in or don't fit in to this family. Um, you can already tell by looking at me, right? I, I'm a little bit of an odd fit. A lot of people talk about our show, and they usually compare it to some other show. You know, they say it's like Andy Griffith or... Yeah, some have said Dukes of Hazard. You know, I'm not too sure about that one. I've heard that. Uh, the Waltons is one we hear quite frequently. I compare our show to the Munsters. Um, you remember that show, right? It was a show about a family of monsters. They were they were wonderful, nice monsters, but they were monsters. And there was this beautiful cousin, Marilyn, that came to live with them, and she had an identity complex because she wasn't as ugly as they were. I could totally relate to Marilyn Munster. <laughs> and so, you know, that's what I compare our show to. And, and look, I don't get a break because even when I grow a beard, Dad and Sai say I look like Yasser Arafat uh, when I grow a beard. Which I think is totally unfair because, number one, Yasser Arafat had a terrible beard. Number two, he was a terrorist. Now, have Cy and my dad looked in the mirror lately? It's all I can ask you. I mean, you tell me. You tell me who looks the most like a terrorist. I'm not getting patted down by TSA, I'll tell you that right now, but they frequently do. When you look at a, a family uh, portrait, there's, it's certain that someone doesn't quite belong. Someone doesn't quite fit in in this family. Uh, but we love Godwin anyway, because it's like he's part of the family. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about our, our, our personalities, because that's really kind of what defines us. And, and growing up in, in, the, in the Robertson family and how unique it was and how different it was. And so the best way I know how to illustrate that to you this morning uh, is to use Labrador Retrievers. Uh, Labradors, are, of course, are our hunting dog of choice. And uh, if you know, if you have a lab, you know what a great dog they are. To us, they're also an extension uh, of our hunting equipment because, I mean, they save us a lot by going to get our ducks. Now, the Black Lab uh, is sort of the go-getter of the lab family. I mean, everybody, that's the one we typically use. I mean, the Black Lab will break through ice. They'll whimper by the truck. They are ready to go and get ducks. It doesn't matter how cold it is or what day it is or anything. That's sort of like Dad and Jace. Now, they are the go-getters of the Robertson family. They're the Black Labs, no doubt about it. If there's 60 days in the season, they're going to be in the duck line 60 days of the season. They love it. Now, the Yellow Lab is still a great hunting dog. But the yellows are a little more domesticated. In other words, they'll still love to hunt, but you know, if it's really cold, they can stay by the fire, watch over the kids, you know, stay home. They don't have to go every day. That's me and Jeff, the oldest and the youngest. We love to hunt, no doubt about it. But you know, we don't have to go every day. Uh, and if, you know, the ducks aren't really flying, why not just stay home, you know? So that's sort of us, our personality. Now, any dog breeder can tell you when you begin to cross the breeds, you get a little kookier and crazier results. Well, that's the chocolate lab, which is, of course, a combination of the black and the yellow. 
Now, our chocolate lab is Willie and our family. I'm just here to tell you. Now, you wouldn't know that from watching the show. You say, oh, Willie, he's the CEO and he runs everything. Willie is a chocolate lab. He doesn't know when season starts. If he didn't have an assistant there with his gun, he wouldn't even know which way to point and shoot. That's Willie. <laughs> But when I try to think of a lab to describe my Uncle Si, there's only one that I can think of. I think you guys really do watch our show. People ask me all over the country about Uncle Si, and they always say, is, is he in, in real life? like he is on the show. And I always compare it to an iceberg. You're only seeing this much crazy on the side. But Sai is a godly man, as is our entire family. When you sort of put us all together, you look at us as a group, you see a group of people uh, that love to hunt, uh, and but also love our Lord more than anything else, and, and love family. And for us, it's Faith, Family, Freedom, uh, for the Family Research Council. For us, it's Faith, Family, and Ducks, and look, the reason we're this way is because God made us this way. And so I've been a part of that, obviously, the family. People will ask Lisa and I, we do an interview, they say, oh, so you guys are the newest to the family. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We've been here all along. We're just the newest to the show. And my debut, of course, came with Till Duck Lewis Park, which was uh, our season four premiere. Uh, it was my debut on the show. It just so happened to be the most watched reality show in the history of cable television. 11.8 million homes tuned in to watch that night, my debut. Thank you, America, for bringing me into the show uh, and showing them who the most important person was. And so now, of course, uh, I'm appearing on a few more shows and, uh, and will be next year for sure. So it's, it's been a great, interesting, fun ride. Uh, but I want to tell you a little more in depth uh, about that today, and especially a little, more, a little bit more about my dad, uh, because I know that you've heard of him, and even more than just the show. Uh, this past year, I spoke at the uh, National Day of Prayer breakfast in Monroe, and I reminded them that the year prior, Dad's book, uh, had Happy, 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 had just released, and Dad spoke that day at our National Day of Prayer rally in Monroe. And after he spoke that, I mean, he got up and he did what he does all over the country. And we, and we go over and we speak. And, and Dad just has this, you know, I mean, peel the paint message of good news and bad news. And a reminder of what our country was founded on and why. And so he did there just a short 15 minutes in Monroe what he does all over the country. And our, and our local newspaper guy who does a lot of stories about us, he came up to him and he was just, I mean, he was ghost white. His eyes were this big around. He said, wow, we got a problem. I said, Greg, what's the problem? He said, if this gets out, you guys are in trouble. I said, in trouble? What do you mean? Dad does this everywhere. He says, man, I'm telling you, this is, this is going to cause you guys a lot of grief and trouble because this message is not politically correct. And I said, well, Greg, you need to write that because I think you're right. And we go over the country speaking. But see, he was our own local guy. He had no idea what we did when we went out and we talked to folks. Of course, he was also a prophet. Because later in December, of course, that year, it did hit the fan, and we were out there, but you know what? It hasn't changed us one bit on who we are, what we believe, and what we teach other people. <laughs> and so I tell you that to tell you that my dad, Phil Robertson, is he has the heart and the mindset of a prophet. Uh, and uh, he's most compared, of course, to John the Baptist. Uh, these are a couple of renderings I found of John. Of course, we don't have a picture of him, but this is kind of what they, people have imagined him to look like. And it looks sort of familiar, doesn't it, uh, to that. Uh, long hair, long beard, naturally camouflaged. He ate off the lamb, and he pointed people to Christ. He was a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and honey. People went out to him. And he said, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. And so I'm always amazed how many people will make their way out to Mount the Cypress. Of course, we had to put up a gate because we had too many people coming out with the success of the show. But how many people make their way out just to talk to my dad about the good news of Jesus Christ? And so he was a lot like John the Baptist. He is that guy. Now, I'm often reminded when I tell people John the Baptist that he also lost his head. 
for speaking the truth, right? Uh, in a culture that really wasn't prepared to hear truth. And yet, you know what? That doesn't change my dad's view at all. Prophets tend to not care about their public image. They tend to talk about judgment as if it's real, and they speak what God gives them to speak. And that's what my dad does. So he is, in that sense, a 21st century prophet. What's interesting is how, how it came to be is phenomenal. It really was just one prayer on a television show. Now, nobody knew our show was going to be as popular as it was. You know, there's reality shows all over the place about all kind of different families and all kind of different crazy scenarios. And you can usually tell when a reality TV show is on, even if you're not in the room for all the beeping that's going on from the other room, right? Because usually it's not the sort of thing you would want to watch or you'd want your children to watch or you certainly wouldn't want your church to watch. Our show was something very different. When we did the first episode of the first show, they beat a couple of times in the episode, even though nobody said any curse words, which highly upset us. And they said, but that's how reality shows are. So we thought we'd just spice it up and put a beep in there, even though Willie and Corey didn't say anything bad. And we said, please don't do that. And in fact, Dad talked to the producers about it. We weren't sure we got through, and so Dad decided, we sat down for the family prayer, and we filmed it around the table, That because we realized that we want to get a message kind of upstairs or up to New York, over to L.A., you do something on camera, because everybody watches that. And so everybody bowed their head around the time for the prayer, and they said, okay, Mr. Phil, if you would start the prayer. And he said, Lord, I just pray today for this group that's here from Hollywood, California. I pray that they would repent and turn to you before you burn them all in the end. <laughs> Jesus, amen. <laughs> so he looked up, you know, and everybody's eyes were this way around. And they said, well, Mr. Robertson, that was really good. Uh, could you do it again and maybe a little softer and, and tone it down just a little bit? He said, well, I want the guys to get a message that that's not what we're about. We're not about beeping and we're not about being of this world. We're something different. And so it's interesting because that prayer has sort of been the catalyst. And I can't tell you how many people I talk to all over the country say my favorite part of your show. I love your show. I love Uncle Si. I love that you guys have fun. My favorite part of the show is when you get together at the end and you pray and you give God praise. And so I thought about just a simple prayer to us. I was there the first time we got together and did that prayer. And it was amazing because it was just what we always do. And therefore, because that was a part of our life, Therefore, it became national television. Now, you know, whenever I look at our family, I see sort of that mindset and see Dad going out, and he's not the first one. There have been other culture changers that uttered prayers that really changed everything. One of my favorites is Elijah the Tishbite. You remember him from 1 Kings around 900 B.C.? Elijah was one of those kind of guys that came on the scene, and he was God's prophet, and he certainly didn't have a very popular message. He basically said it's not going to rain until someone gets away from this idolatry. And then all of a sudden the rain stopped. And so for three years, he basically had to hide out and God provide for him as God was trying to teach a message to Israel. Now, of course, Elijah specifically had a message for the king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. And he wanted them to know that if you would turn and do the right thing, the nation would follow you. And he knew that Jezebel had all these priests of Baal and all these priests of Asherah. And he knew that as long as they followed that evil, that their culture would continue in its demise. But Elijah, see, didn't care about public opinion. He just cared that God had a message in his heart. So Elijah was one to, you know, be theatrical. And so they decided, of course, to have what I call the melee on Mount Carmel. And they went up there, and it was 850 priests versus Elijah. And you know why I like this scene is because it's a lot like an episode of Duck Dynasty, when we think about it. I mean, there's a challenge that's laid out in the beginning. You watch our show, you know, early on there's some sort of challenge between the brothers. There's a lot of taunting that goes on on our show, and certainly Elijah was a taunter. I mean, those prophets were slashing themselves, and they were calling down for Baal to send fire, and nothing happened. And Elijah was over there saying, well, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he went to the bathroom. Maybe he's not listening today. Yell louder. You know, he was taunting them the whole time, just like our show. And then, of course, what I love about the most is there were pyrotechnics at the end. <laughs> because whenever Elijah decided to call on the name of the Lord, a fire fell from heaven 
And you know, we like to blow things up on our show as well because we understand the power of God. Here's the prayer that Elijah uttered. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all the things at your command. Answer me, Lord, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. That was a culture-changing prayer. The people listened. Unfortunately, of course, Ahab and Jezebel did not listen. And many times in our country, the leadership doesn't listen to the people. And so, therefore, the idolatry will continue to go. Of course, Elijah was disillusioned. He was disheartened. He sat down under a broom tree and he hoped to die. But then God sent him a little earth, wood, and fire concert by to remind him that he really was God. And he said in a gentle whisper, I've got work for you to do. Do you compare that to another culture changer named Jonah who came along about 50 years later? And here was a guy who also had a message of judgment, but he also had a message of grace along with it. God sent him, of course, to the Assyrians, and he said, I want you to go and preach a message, but that's the last place he wanted to go. These were the enemies of Israel. You see how God had a plan. Later, another 150 years after that, the Assyrians would be the one to go and cause judgment on North Israel itself. And God went to them first and said, if you turn, you turn to me, you repent, forgiveness can be given to you. And he did it with a reluctant prophet named Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go. So God had to send a little fish gut cruise line over to pick him up, <laughs> send him over and spit him out on the bank and said, you do what I've told you to do. So he went in and reluctantly preached. And I've always liked to imagine what it was like for Jonah because, you know, he didn't seem too fired about it. Repair and turn to God and I hope things turn out good. I mean, he was not excited about his message. But that's the amazing thing about the gospel of Christ and the good news of Jesus. It changes hearts in spite of the message. And it changed hearts that day. And so Jonah, just like Elijah, sat on a hill and sat up under a broom tree, sat under a catapult tree, I guess, because there were worms on it. And he said... I hope I die if these people turn. Now, what a heart for the prophet of God. But that's how bold he was. But God told him something in a gentle whisper as well. He said, you know what, Jonah? I'm about changed lives, not about egos. And lives changed that day because people turned. God's judgment was relented. And God would use those people as part of his plan. But it's really interesting because Jonah uttered a prayer when he was inside that fish and said this. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And even he realized that his hatred for these other people, these enemies of God, was not more powerful than salvation. And so there's great messages for us to learn from these prophets. And when I think about Jesus who came here, the Bible says the word becoming flesh with a message full of grace and truth. We are to speak judgment. And I want to encourage you guys to tell the truth about what the Bible says consistently. As a family, we're going to do that. But you also have a message of grace. People can turn to God. People can turn to Christ and turn away from everything in their lives that has destroyed them or attempted to destroy them. All of you know, if you follow in our family, we are a very transparent and authentic people who say we have made many mistakes in our lives, but God has saved us from each and every one of them. We are imperfect, but we serve a perfect and risen Savior. And so that's our message for people. God is God, therefore I am not. I have no reason to put myself in his judgment seat, but I can learn that God has a job for me. I've been Elijah sitting under that room tree, and I know you have too. Disillusion, disheartened. The country's going terribly. What can we do to change it? There's nobody left. And then we have to get that reminder that, you know what? I've got 7,000 reserves that have not bowed the knee to bail. There are men and women out here in part of our country waiting for us to help lead them to someplace different. But we gotta get out from under the broom tree. We gotta not just look for earth, wind, and fire, but we gotta listen for the words of God. And I've been Jonah before. I've been sitting under that vine, feeling sorry for myself, 
thinking my ego was the way to go. And I've had to repent and say, God, I need to speak to your enemies with a message of grace and truth. And I'll never stop doing that. Jesus Christ has called us to something greater. When you see our family sitting around that table, offering praise to God, know this, we are with you. We join you in every community and every place in America to show people the light and the truth. That is our blessing. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today with men and women who love you, who will go back all over this country to inspire their people to keep a heart that's close to you. Father, help us to never lose sight of the message we have that's for all, for those that love you, for those that are enemies of you. It's a message of grace, truth, healing, and forgiveness. But it's the message, most of all, that says that your son is one to lead us to something eternal. I'm very grateful for the opportunity and the platform that you've given us as a family. You have raised us up for such a time as this. And I'm grateful that pastors and their families and churches all over America have a message of truth. Help us get beyond the walls of our buildings and into the culture that surrounds us. Father, I pray for the leadership of our country. I pray for those who have not had you in mind and you in their hearts that we will repent. We will turn to you and we will follow your ways. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. Appreciate you.